I'm a feminist, but today I walked into the dressing room and said, I'm wearing this because I'm giving Wednesday Adams. <laughs> now, I think you'll agree. Re- look yeah. at it again, audience. Very nice, Deb. <laughs> Strong Wednesday Adams energy. <laughs> working now, it. What it is, if you're listening at home, it's a black sequined mini with a little black jacket and then a lot of white Chanel style pearls. I'm a feminist, but she was quite a bit of a Nazi. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. She was very stylish. So, I mean, I, I think we're allowed to wear black and white. I, I, even though she was a Nazi, but she did bring it in because she was raised in a convent. Before that, black was only for mourning. She did bring it in. Um, I'm also wearing, and this is uncharacteristic, I think you'll agree, like black tights with a sort of, it's not really a Doc Martin, but it's got that vibe, but it's more like a school shoe. Lady boot. It's, yeah, it's exactly. It's a brogy lady boot. Mm. What would be more appropriate is if I were to dress like the headmistress of Nevermore Academy. Is it Nevermore? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Nevermore yeah. Academy. Yeah. But I have decided to go Wednesday Adams. Great. And I feel powerful. I feel like I could just stare at someone and their head could explode. Yeah. <laughs> What's unfeminist about that? Because you're like a gothic child. I guess because I'm. <laughs> I don't know that my icons should be children. Do yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. I. Why am I trying to look like a kid? She's basically a moody teenager, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday Adams, who has, doesn't really know herself yet. And it's got, she's like, got her own series, though. She has. She has. She's got her own Netflix series. My she's son got, keeps begging to watch she's it. She's got barriers up. You know, she's not, she doesn't know herself yet. So there are yeah. feminist components to Wednesday Adams. But I feel I should be mentoring her. I should be helping her with her GCSEs. Yeah. I shouldn't be going, oh, can I look like I'm in school uniform? Yeah, What's wrong with me? But I don't care because I love it. I think you look cool as shit. Thank you. That's not unfeminist at all. I had a much less cool version, like a little moment like that recently. So I really love weightlifting. Uh, and at the moment it's very cold. And um, I've been weightlifting in a jumper. And the other day I missed a lift because I was giggling so much because I realised actually with my weightlifting belt on over a jumper, a 100% channel in trunch ball. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> That's a vibe, isn't it? Is that, you, is that, I'm not really sure I'm ready for that. I think the Emma Thompson um, trunch ball is so oh, incredible. Like she's so good. But she's really got a kind of there's a humanity behind the eyes. There's a pain there. There's a, she's not just like a villain. It's it's oh, there's so much more yeah. going on. Oh, she's extraordinary. She's it's it's a, brilliant. I think it's, it's an iconic performance. And her voice, the use the of her character. voice is really yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It, but more, but better. Mm. It's incredible. Mm. Um, do you have an I'm a feminist part? Yeah, sorry, got loads. Um, I'm a feminist, but I got a new passport pick this week, and it made me Google neck transplants. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? This is all to do with a failure about positive self-talk. I, it made me Google neck transplants. I looked like some meat that someone had left out in a blizzard, and then someone else had popped two small coals on the top of for eyes. Um, I looked so meaty in this passport picture, it could have turned a boomer vegan. <laughs> but your whole, sort of, your, your most famous, most glorious show is called Hench. It's oh, like all about, it doesn't like, mean that I want to look like that. <laughs> you look I love looking you? Hench, but it, I, my, my neck in that photo is wider than a swimming pool. That's... <laughs> It's I'm wider than my son, my seven-year-old be. son, couldn't unassisted swim the width of my neck <laughs> in that photo. I don't look like I look in that photo now. There's no point looking at me now, Debs. <laughs> don't argue, because there's two more of these. What's your next one? <laughs> you, your neck is perfectly in proportion with your shoulders and your head, and that photo, whatever it said, was... A I'll show you it later, and we I'm, can all have a laugh. OK. <laughs> Uh, I'm a feminist, but when I came into the dressing room tonight and said, I'm giving Wednesday Adams, I was hoping it would come. I was hoping, to be honest, someone would mention it before I had to. But <laughs> nobody did. And so I just had to bring it up, which I thought, thought that's a bit disappointing because there were a, you know, a bunch of people in the dressing room who could have said it. Could have said, wow, look at what you're wearing. You look like Wednesday Adams. But they didn't. They didn't. So I had to, again, compliment myself. And... Um, this started a really intersectional conversation with Chloe Petz, who's our incredible guest for this evening. She's an amazing comedian. We were talking about Wednesday Adams being an outcast, which I, I really, it's really great and really interesting, but also they are like werewolves and stuff. So, and Chloe went, yeah, well, like, what are they living on? 
she went like, they've got to live on human blood, haven't they? Werewolves and vampires. That's the whole thing about them. And we had this huge intersectional feminist conversation in which Chloe Petz finally entered with, um, I think we need to have a conversation about ethically sourced human blood. <laughs> and I was like, of all the things we could be talking about in the dressing room. I loved it. I'm a feminist, but I've got a new passport pick this week. <laughs> and um, I failed to maintain positive self-talk about it because in the pic, I look like an advert for vitamin D tablets <laughs> and cosmetic gel reduction. <laughs> And that's in my life for 10 years now. So now the only person I'm showing that passport to is border security staff or a casting director, but only if they're specifically casting for the lead in something where they're looking for a pale, stoned murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's lovely. No. I'm a feminist. But the other night I had to do karaoke and it was Christmas karaoke and I chose Santa Baby and Fuck You All. Stop judging me. It's <laughs> I said I'd do a feminist version of the lyrics, wow. but then I d- didn't. I love it. There's nothing satirical about Santa Baby. It's just feeding into every stereotype the patriarchy wants me to be that I don't want to be except during the three verses, three choruses of that song. <laughs> it's fun sometimes, isn't it? Just to yeah. be, you know, I've often you can said mix it. it up. You can sing it in other styles. You don't have to sing it sexily. Oh, that's you a thought. You do a <gasps> sort of West Country folk version. Oh, no one's getting a boner over that. Head Santa head. baby. <laughs> Bring me something down the chimney tonight. So like my combined harvester type yeah. thing. Yeah. Or a kind of a headbanging one. I could do a sort of... Santa <laughs> baby! Next step for Santa baby! I'm afraid that gave me a boner. I found that more sexy than the rich, the OC. Okay, I'm going to come up with a version that's a dominatrix version. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like, Santa baby, slip a sable under the tree right now on your knees. (laughs) That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Lovely business. I'm a feminist, feminist, but I got a new passport picture this week. Tell me more. And no one is ever allowed to look at me from the front when my face is neutral ever again. And no, I can't just go and get it done again because I'm so vain. This is already my third attempt and each try, each try costs 13 pounds and 99 pence. Where does one go to buy shares in Snappy Snaps? I am a feminist, but I have to admit, I have also spent a lot of money on passport photos back in the day. But do you know what I found? One of them, she put them through the whole system and one eye was closed. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But do you know what I've discovered? Do you know what I've discovered? Do you know what you're allowed to use? A mirror? I don't even bother with that. No. I don't know why I... No, do you know what you're allowed to use? If you... Because it's all digital now, right? Yeah. So if you have had, which I know you have, say your hench headshots where you look very beautiful and made up, but as long as you're not smiling, you can just edit around that with, and put that into the full white border. You're not allowed earrings. There's so many rules. Yeah, You've yeah. got to be straight on. I'm not straight on in any photo I've ever chosen to look at again. But next time you go for your headshots, <laughs> next time you go for your headshots, you just get a straight on passport photo with a beautiful light, with the makeup, all of that. And that, you then pop it into that format you're allowed to do. Deborah, we're, I am not someone who's ever going to go for a makeover before a passport photo. <laughs> you, well, you've known me for long enough. You get professional shots done by pro- Yes, once a year, because it's part of my job. All I I'm do, saying, I have begun to enjoy that those. process. But yeah, save, save those. those and and also, you, it's, it's, everyone hates their passport photo. Just give us a cheer if you like your passport photo. <laughs> well done. Okay, Good. all right. Well, those people are annoying. Yeah. That, <laughs> All right. Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist. With me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Jessica Costacu, and our very special guest, Chloe Pets, with music from Grace Petrie. of the year here we are out last year do you remember last Christmas 
when I gave you my heart. And then the very next day, no, do you remember last Christmas when it got all COVID-y at this point? And then we all had to retreat in and we had to cancel Campus Christmas. And this year we just had Campus Christmas. Woo! Just give us a cheer if you came. Woo! Well, the rest of you have got, to, got it to listen to on the podcast. It was so much fun. It was absolutely brilliant. And we raised about 10 grand box offers. Oh, wow. For, yeah, for the Say It Loud Club, who were run for and by LGBTQ plus refugees. Everyone on the bill was queer. Uh, we had uh, LGBTQ plus refugees on the bill. It was absolutely fantastic. And we also had Despicable Daisy come over from Dublin. She came over fully pregnant. Um, and she brought her amazing capes. And she sold those capes. And we also made a few grand from capes. Um, which is really how I like to fundraise is through sparkly capes. Uh, that is all I would do, really, if I could, is just, I would just be a professional cape, not even maker, I don't want to sew. I would just dream up capes, Daisy would make them, and the end. That, that, would, be, that would be how I would, how I would fully make my living if I were allowed. But um, I am so thrilled uh, to also be here on this stage with a microphone, of course, if I just dreamt up capes at home, I wouldn't get to do this fun part uh, where I come and talk to you and even touch you like this. Oh, I, did, I did the back of hands because I felt... Yeah, I just felt that was less covid But is it? It probably isn't. Uh, just give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. Woo! Give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. Um, so notice how those cheers sound less powered empowered less feminist if you will um who was it cheering here were you you both cheered you both don't know where you're at you listen in the car oh you do know okay okay great i thought you look like you know because you're sitting in the second row and you're wearing a jumper that says slay the patriarchy thank you oh you've got to slay the patriarchy as well who's selling and slay is spelt like christmas slay just to be clear um sorry i thought we were sold out and we were a little bit light on um, and it's because all these people are late because, uh, I don't know, have you been fighting the patriarchy? <laughs> have you? Is that why you're late? Fighting the Tories and the train strikes. Fighting the Tories and the train strikes, yes. Um, oh, yes, that's true. There'll be some people who can't get here because of train strikes. Thank you, welcome, come in, come in. Um, to, is someone doing Slay the Patriot? Because you've got the same jumper in a different colour. The internet. The, the man, internet's the doing man, it. I've heard, of, I've heard of them. <laughs> They're great, the internet, aren't they? Do you know what, though? So problematic in some ways, amazing in others. Um, yeah. Can you imagine being as polarised as the internet? You'd fall apart. You'd explode. Why doesn't the internet explode? Oh, I think it is. Elon Musk. Um, well, listen, just give us a cheer if you're wearing some other kind of feminist jumper. Woo! Or paraphernalia. Yes. Uh, you're wearing a T-shirt that says, Unexplained public laughter disrupts the patriarchy. I love that shirt because it's mine. Uh, <laughs> What that's about is people would always tweet and say, oh, I was laughing so much at the gym, people were staring at me when I was listening to the podcast, or I was laughing so much on the train, a man asked if I was okay. And uh, that's why we made those shirts. Unexplained public laughter disrupts the patriarchy. It's patriarchal forces go, what's going on over there? Just someone's just laughing madly, insanely, wildly. Um, anybody else? Is a Choose Love shirt? Yes, there is. Thank you very much. Anyone else got any feminist paraphernalia on? No. Um, <laughs> People have come, but in you, are you wearing a feminist T-shirt in your heart? Yeah. Yes, excellent. What does it say? <laughs> it's not very well written. Um, uh, I'm asking people for a, a low-level act of feminism that will intimidate nobody. Um, just something you've done where other people think I can do better than that, and that encourages your fellow feminists. Uh, so, has anyone got anything pathetic that they've done? Yes. Spilled your water. How is that a feminist act? So I'm looking I'm for something like... I'm not ashamed of it. Excellent. I've made a mess and I'm unashamed. So this good. That's strong. That's strong. Absolutely. It's, I've made a mess and I'm not going to be like, oh no, I'm so sorry. If someone, of course, trips and falls, then we will look back on this differently. But let's act as if that's not going to happen. Anyone else got anything they want to share? Yes? Oh. And then when he commented, I was like, 
but they're great. And your girlfriend said I could keep them on. Oh, so you went to a friend's house in knee-high sparkly boots. You knew he would say shoes off house. You said, I do not respect that, <laughs> man, because your girlfriend said I can keep them on. Yeah, yeah that's the sisterhood, the sisterhood at work. <laughs> That's, that's, that's some extremely low-level feminism going on there. <laughs> that's what I've asked for. That's what I've asked for. Has anyone got anything uh, you could go worse, higher, lower, or the same? Yes. Um, I've recently quit my job. Uh, recently quit your job. With a really toxic male CEO. With a toxic male CEO. And uh, I accepted a new offer. And I accepted a, a new offer from a place. Um, I'm saying this for the podcast, by the way, just so you know. Exactly. With two female founders, gone to a fit place with two female founders. Excellent work. Phenomenal. You've told the toxic boss to sod off, and you've gone and you're working with women. Excellent. I doubled my salary. And you doubled your salary. Come on. Happy Christmas to you. Thank you very much. That's, yeah, well, that's, that, that's better than spilling your water. And, going, fuck you, floor. You're probably made by a patriarchal, powerful man. Uh, this is some good work. Anyone got anything, anything they need help with? Yes? Oh, no, you don't need help. But quickly, go go anyway, because I've picked you now. You've got a Santa hat. <gasps> oh, I love that. She said, I listen to your podcast all the time, and every time I come, I bring someone new. Oh, my God. You're like a disciple. <laughs> this is wonderful. And you're wearing a Santa hat. Look, you're reclaiming that masculine, patriarchal, <laughs> old man Christmas symbol. You're modernizing it. That's right. Anyone got anything they need help with? Yes? Oh, this sounds good. Come out and say it into the mic. Okay. Just give her a big round of applause. <laughs> What's your name? Bethany. Bethany. Okay, Bethany, tell the audience uh, here and at home. Uh, so I run a small charity called Refunet that matches refugees and asylum seekers with online volunteer tutors. And we really, really need some more volunteer tutors at the moment. Excellent. And this is for language skills or anything? Uh, so mostly English for speakers of other languages, but also maths and science. And at the moment, we particularly need help with people that are preparing for their GCSEs. Um, super flexible. So it's like one hour a week, you decide the time with the student, and then we're here to support people that have any questions. Wonderful. Thank you. So any GCSE subjects, is anyone here qualified to tutor GCSE? So if you did it at A level, you could probably tutor a GCSE, I would say. Um, if you, especially if you did it at a degree, just give us a cheer. Woo! What? Just shout out subjects you can do. Maths. Maths. English. English. I could probably do some maths, actually. <laughs> Um, I know it's not for me, but just to keep... If your student cancels one week, just I, I probably could do with maths. I'm not very numerate. Um, I, don't really, I don't really care, honestly. Just, someone else could do it. Uh, <laughs> French? Do you need French? Who could do French? We don't really need French. You don't need French. <laughs> what do you need? English, math, science. English, math, science. Just give us a cheer if you did A-level or degree English. Woo! Yeah, loads of my audience have did, did an English degree. We'll, I mean, we don't know. We, we're stumbling around in life with a degree in fucking Jane Austen and some old white man poems. Yeah. We might as well put it to use. Okay, great. Just maths? Science? Just give us a cheer now if you've got one hour a week, even for like, how many, what would be the minimum weeks you could do? Uh, three months. Three months. So 12, one hour a week for 12 weeks. Just give us a cheer. Yeah, okay, you've got quite a lot here. But if you're listening at home, how do they get in touch? Um, so uh, you can contact us. Uh, our website is refunet.co.uk, which is R-E-F-U-N-E-T. Um, and we're on social media, Refunet on Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. Wonderful. Please get in touch. That's a wonderful thing to do. And with that, I think we're ready to start the show. Are you ready to meet my incredible co-pilot for this evening? Then put your hands together and make wonderful woohooing noises for a guilty feminist favourite. It's the one and only Jessica Foster Q. Thank you. Um, uh, lovely to be here doing stand up uh, on a guilty feminist. It's been a while. Um, I've been very busy. I've been on a tour um, of my show Wench. Um, I've had a really great fun time with it, um, but it did actually, as a tour, not the show. We very much enjoyed doing the show every night. Lovely people that came to the show going, ha ha ha, that bit was all fine. Um, 
unfortunately, I think the act of doing the tour created, I don't know what the science word for it is, I'm going to go for um, a curse. <laughs> it became cursed. Um, don't believe me? Buckle in. The tour begun on September the 8th. Uh-oh, dead queen. <gasps> yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, you, if that's your reaction to that, you're going to need to relax. There's more on that. Um, loads of other manifestations of the curse. Um, oh, I should add that apart from the queen, no human or creature was harmed during the curse of wench. Okay, no one was harmed. Um, loads of just mad sh- sh- stuff happened. Like, um, do you remember in mid-October there's a great big fire in a building site in Leeds on a Saturday, the fifteenth of October? I did that. Um, Coventry had a big, big fire inside the building. <gasps> um, only place where the curse manifested once the tour had already, uh, once the show had already begun, Cambridge. I had to have a couple of coked-up surveyors chucked out um, for heckling. <laughs> I oh, know, you didn't expect that in my audience, basically. Some of you have never met me, but you would have. Obviously, it's Cambridge, so you expect a couple of surveyors. Um, but, all right, there's some in. Um, but you don't expect gacked up ones. That's not the sort of people who come to my tour shows, basically. If, you, if you've never heard of me, my audience is mainly made up of women in dungarees, and, and that's no bad thing. Um, 90% of the audience will have access to, if not their own allotment. Um, <laughs> I'm not interested in people uh, haggling all the way through it. That's just not how it works. These guys were horrid. There's just two men, they're just haggling all the way through it. Um, and then in the end, I sort of, you know, I kept stopping and trying to talk to them at one point and went, look, I can tell, I can tell there's no malice. And one of them went, oh no, there's malice. Ah! I have to kick them out. Oh. Anyway, um, yeah, um, my favourite manifestation of the curse was Aldershot. Um, much as that was just the end of the sentence. Um, <laughs> no, I like, I like Aldershot. Um, my fa- what happened there was, um, I was an hour and a half late for my own tour show. Best reason ever for being late for anything, actually, go to feminist. Um, swan in the road. <laughs> yeah. As I said, relax, the swan's fine. As far as I'm aware, thriving. Um, it wasn't just any old swan, big boy. Um, not just any old road either, M25. <laughs> And I can tell you, the first thought is probably, well, that swan has taken the Queen's death very hard. Um, no. Actually, if anything, I have front row seats for this one. I, as, a, as a car pulled to a stop, you know, the traffic sort of got completely stopped on the motorway. I thought, oh, bloody hell, it's one of them classic car-on-car accidents somewhere up ahead. No, swan in the road. And brilliant news for me, the swan was right by my car. I got to see all, all of this, right? Um, and, and the swan I, didn't look any, it didn't look sad. It looked, very tough to be in the road very confident very much at home in the road really owning the road what was great about that was not only did you get to see a swan close up from within the safety of your own car lovely to see a swan looking so confident and at home um, but then I got to see two policemen um, try and capture the swan <laughs> Um, I don't love authority and, 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 I, and I just enjoyed to see this I think we can safely assume from the policeman's general demeanour that swan capture doesn't come under their main training um, it was brilliant. They were terrified. They were tiptoeing over it. They had a neon jacket each. They were trying to throw over the swan. A swan was just sort of just taking longer strides away from them. The swan had all the status. It took them fucking ages, about 25 minutes it took them to eventually capture the swan. One of them finally got its jacket over its head. Then what was brilliant about that is that the policeman who picked the swan up definitely underestimated the weight of the swan. <laughs> he could barely clean it, if you're aware. He's like... Aah! He'd gone purple, if you're listening, he'd gone thoroughly purple. He got it to like waist height and then he eventually sort of shimmied it up. And you think out of the two policemen, that's going to be the one who's the most emasculated in this situation. No, his friend's job was to hold the swan's neck. <laughs> so that was one of my favourite things I've ever seen an authority figure do as well. And they sort of, as a team, had to sort of waddle it over to the verge, hump it into the verge, and then pin it there for ages while they waited for assistance. They didn't have a swan ready van. Um, <laughs> And what I loved about watching that was um, just really looked like they were arresting it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so first night of my tour, um, the Queen perished. Um, you know, it, it, what, what a storm. What a storm of a night it was for everyone, I'm sure. I hadn't realised what was going on, I'll be honest with you. My um, people, lovely people who run my tour contacted me in the afternoon and said, something's up with the Queen, I think everything will run as normal. Turns out to be a very loose approach um, to how the world works. Um, so I didn't know what was, I didn't know the gravity of what was going on. So when I got in my car, I did turn on the news, obviously to find out a bit more about this situation. Uh, I still didn't understand the imminency of the threat of 
Uh, I did, look, what I'm saying is I didn't know the code words. Did you? I didn't know the code. I didn't know the words comfortable. Men actually been dead for hours. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'll be honest, I'm pissed off to have learnt that, frankly, because it's ruined my best describing word for pretty much all my clothes. <laughs> um, I got to the venue. Um, uh, uh, I won't say where it was. We can just sort of generally say horribly close to Windsor. Um, and the staff there were like, I see you've received, arrived then, so um, just to sort of check then, do you actually want to go ahead, do you, with the sort do you want to go ahead sort of with, with your, with your com- comedy show? Um, and I don't know if I read the energy of that right. Um, I think I said something like, fuck, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, well, it doesn't look the Queen is going to die, so and we will have to announce it over the tannoy as soon as she dies, okay, even if that's in the middle of the show. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> just sort of wrapping my head around that. They went, well, just to let you know, we'll get, we will test the tannoy, so you'll get an idea of what the tannoy sounds like, OK? So you can... I was like, OK, OK, thank you. All oh, right. Woohoo, first night of the tour. OK. Um, but, you know, if you remember that night, it was about 6.30 when we officially announced things, right? So it did come over the tannoy. It was before my show. I was in the foyer with what turned out to be, you know, most of my audience, right? And I, um, um, I was standing there sort of ordering some food at my tour support, and... Um, the tunnel came on and announced the Queen's death, but um, I don't, um, I don't know when they last used the tannoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what happened is when they turned it on, it came on with this noise: "Bing bong." <laughs> <laughs> That's not a sad noise, is it? That's an objectively happy noise, isn't it? <laughs> Shut your eyes and try and feel sad. Bing bong. <laughs> That's a happy, not everyone in there just perked up. We're like, oh, fuck, I'm perking up. You just do. Bing bong. Half the people in there instinctively went to undo their seatbelt and remove their overhead luggage. <laughs> Bing bong. And then the panic in the girl's voice, obviously, because she wasn't. It's no one, none of us, her, least of all her, are expecting a fucking bing bong. So she then comes over the tunnel again, I'm just to let everybody... She, no one had given her a script. It's a shit show, this. You strap this, she went, oh, I'm just to let you know the terrible news that Queen Elizabeth II has died, actually. So that's sad, isn't it? Um, can, I, uh, can you just make sure you're all really respectful and silent for a few minutes of joining us for respectful silence now? No one had any time for any respectful silence as so they whacked on a crackly old version of God Save the Queen. Try and feel sad through this. It wasn't sad. As soon as that finished, I was like, finally, a moment for Phil's sad. In the staff, the bar staff genuinely shouted, I think they're just testing the tannoy. <laughs> I, didn't, I knew I couldn't laugh out loud, but my whole body was shaking with repressed laughter, where internally I was thinking, I think if it was just a test, they wouldn't have used the word, she's dead. <laughs> And then we went into what I would consider to be one of the weirdest weeks of my life in terms of my perception of the nation I live in. What a fucking bizarre thing all of that was. We went, oh, cancel fun, cancel all the fun. The news, I hate the news telling me how to feel. The news are like, you're sad, cancel fun, you're sad. Instead, we're going to have rolling news coverage of pundits, pink trousered fucking gammony pundits telling us how fucking fun she was while we cancel all your fun and most of your jobs even if you're self-employed even at the fucking pointy end of a cost of living crisis while we all talk about how fun she was stop having fun you're sad i hated it but what was mad wait 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 don't clap me i went along with it and so did all of you that's what blew my mind we had four or five days then where I honestly couldn't believe it. I was doing it. Everyone was doing it. Everyone, I was sort of wandering around to myself going, we are all doing it, right? We are all genuinely pretending to be personally affected. <laughs> and I did too. I did it as well. I walked around like that. For the listeners, sad face. Even I wasn't brave enough to start the hashtag not my nana. <laughs> I've got some rude stuff about the king, but I reckon I'll leave it there. (laughs) Jessica Fosque, everybody! Hello, 
Guilty Feminist of Dublin calling all gay Michaels. We will be back in Dublin, but this time at the Sugar Club on the 24th of January, 7.30pm. And I will be coming over with Alison Spittle. We'll have some incredible local Dublin guests as always. We will also be back at King's Place in London on the 26th of January. We are doing two episodes back to back. One is with Carrie Ann Lloyd talking about grief and her new book. She is an absolute master at this topic. Uh, so come along because it's a wonderful, warm place to discuss it. Whether you've experienced grief, are experiencing it now, or will experience it, this will be a wonderful show. Also, we will be at Rose Theatre in Kingston on Sunday, the 29th of January. That's 5 p.m. It's an early show so that you can be tucked up in bed by 10 o'clock any evening with a cup of cocoa. To book tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows and you can get tickets for any of those shows. While you are at it, could you also just jump on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review? You can leave a review for any episode. Um, ideally, make it five stars, uh, rate, review, and also subscribe if you don't subscribe or follow because it helps other people find the podcasts and it reminds you that we're on. While you're there, if you could subscribe to Media Storm, which is our investigative journalist podcast, uh, it has won so many awards. It's only in its second series and it's won and been nominated for so many awards. Most recently, uh, the two hosts, Matilda Mallison and Helena Wadia, were nominated for a British Journalism Award for Best Interviewers. That's against all the journalists in the whole of the UK. So, um, it's really worth a listen. You are going to learn about so many incredible feminist things you never knew you needed to know. Also, while you're there, could you please subscribe to Fock It Up Comedy Club, which is Kima Bob's incredible show. You are going to discover so many exciting, new, talented femmes of colour who are comedians. So please subscribe to both of those things. Uh, if you could uh, leave a review, uh, rate it, give it five stars and tell other people about it. Also, if you'd like an ad-free version of this show, please support us on Patreon. And now, back to the podcast. Our guest today <clears throat> is one of the most exciting rising comedy stars on the circuit. She is an alumna of the prestigious Pleasance Comedy Reserve, has been shortlisted for the BBC Comedy Award and is co-founder of The Lol Word, a queer comedy collective that hosts monthly sellout shows with the finest female and non-binary queer acts. Please welcome to the stage the incredible Chloe Petz. Uh, well, hello. My name is uh, Chloe. Um, I think uh, I had a sort of revelation about myself really recently that the most at home that I have ever felt is on a wedding dance floor. Um, and I think that is because my favourite mode of transport is via knee slide, um, <laughs> sort of surrounded by unprecedented levels of cleavage. Um, uh, so I, I think I think what happens at, at a wedding is I like would largely identify as a woman, but at a wedding I, I identify as a man um, with a tie on his head. Um, uh, I just fucking love it, and I know that I'm a man at a wedding because I do that thing that all blokes do at weddings, which is I make best friends in the entire world with another man that I will never see again. Okay. <laughs> The wedding is to the man what the club toilet queue is to the woman, okay? <laughs> and this man, because, like, I, I, the only weddings that I've been to are heterosexual weddings, and I just get so hetero in that, in that setting that the man that I befriend, he'll never... Like, in any other circumstance, I'll be like, this is possibly one of the worst people I've ever met <laughs> in my fucking life. But at a wedding, he'll come up to me and be like, hi, my name's Josh. Um, my interests are Bitcoin and finance. <laughs> and I'll be like, he's perfect. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about the wedding. And I'm like a sort of like, I'm like kryptonite to straight men at a wedding. Every wedding I go to, there's like a conveyor belt of straight blokes that are trying to befriend me. And that's not, not to be a brag. I honestly can't work out what it is they like about me. But I think it's because, I think it's because like, um, they've never seen one of me before. <laughs> you know? They're sort of looking at me like, she's like Dave, but with a vagina. What? <laughs> like, She's funny, but I don't want to fuck her. What? What's this? What is this? I also think that I'm like really useful to um, the straight man at a wedding in the bouquet throw. I think I'm a, I'm a useful ally, right? We all know what the bouquet throw is at a wedding, don't we? 
Yeah? It's ba- for those that may- might not know, it's what happens is the single women at the wedding will get onto the dance floor at some point in the night, and then the bride will throw a bouquet over her head into this crowd of single women, and whichever one catches it is the next one to be sold off. Okay? <laughs> Um, and I'm obviously outstanding at the bouquet throw. In the last year, I've been to three weddings, three bouquets caught, of course. I'm, for, those, for the listeners at home, it's because I'm fucking massive, right? Uh, I fuck, I, it's, it's really funny, like, when you get onto the wedding dance floor sort of with my gender presentation, again, for the, for the people at home, very masculine, um, because you sort of see the faces all of, of all these, like, little hetero cis women just sort of fall and um i've never seen a bunch of like boring straight women arguing for trans inclusion in sport (laughs) so readily like as soon as i come on like trying to catch that bouquet they're like are you sure this is the right category for you (laughs) (laughs) do you not want to go and do drinking with the men (laughs) no no give me my fucking flowers Uh, (laughs) <laughs> and then what will happen is the bride will throw the flowers over her head and all of the straight men that I've befriended will run round and sort of lift me like a rugby line out. <laughs> <laughs> I get what I want, which is to catch my flowers. They get what they want, is, uh, which is not to propose to their boring girlfriend, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so um, I, as I say, I'm very masculine. Uh, but recently, I've sort of, be, I, I feel like I've become comfortable enough in my masculinity that I feel comfortable sort of embracing bits of my femininity that I am um, that I hadn't once sort of embraced. Because even like things that you would traditionally call masculine, uh, feminine. Sorry, I've always done quite masculine, like menstruation. I know that that isn't just women that do it, but traditionally we would call it a feminine thing. Um, not the way I do it. I do it strong, consistent. Powerful, uh, <laughs> like my motor. Um, uh, but what what happened the other day is my girlfriend. She asked me to go and get sanitary products for her. And usually, I would be absolutely fine with this. I've been menstruating for well over fifteen years. As soon as she asked me to do it, when I got to the aisle of Tesco where I had to get the, the sanitary products, I turned into the most confused dozy boyfriend you've ever. I was going like, "Babe, I don't know what I don't know what flavour to get, lemon or lime. What's going on?" <laughs> um, but yeah, I, recently I, I realised that I am trying to get more feminine, and uh, and I went to um, my my friends, my friends, some of my friends uh, had a nail painting party. Because my friends are sort of hitting their 30s and it's like having a breakdown, essentially. <laughs> you know what I'm Trying to recapture their youth, just like sniffing gel pens, going around with Jane Norman bags. <laughs> um, and I went to the party and was like, no, nah, I'm not having my nails painted, not me. When I get my nails painted, I feel like a dog in socks. Do you know what I <laughs> sort of, I just don't know where I am. But they convinced me by going like, it makes you better at finger, and I was like, sign me up. Uh, <laughs> I've also been trying the feminine act of um, flirting with men. Um, and I know that doesn't necessarily have to be feminine. Again, it can be masculine. Not the way that I do it. I become a lovely lady. Oh, God. <laughs> the way I flirt with men, I flutter in my eyebrows, throwing them my, my, my nail-painted fingers. Um, but, but I think what happens in that situation is when these blokes, um, like blokes I've sort of flirted with, straight men that i flirted with, they'll, if they ever try to sort of go any further than the flirt and take it to something physical, I'll be like, back off, mate, I'm not gay. Uh, <laughs> no fucking homo, mate, back off. <laughs> Unless um, a gay man mistakes me for another gay man, in that circumstance, very much homo. Oh, God. That twink thinks I'm man enough to bum him. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Cheers. Chloe Pets, everybody. Yes, please. Come take a large seat. Uh, thank, thank you. you. That was Brilliant. wonderful to hear. Well, well thank you. Flutter in my eyebrows. Were you? Really you were nice. fluttering your eyebrows. No, at this that line's gonna tickle me forever. Oh, that's so nice. Really nice. Well, it, well, it was a very new bit, and I felt so comfortable with you guys that I thought I'd, I give, I give it a go. Yeah, and yeah. Fluttering really your eyebrows. Nice. Really nice. That'll, yeah. that'll go in it. My eyebrows. Did I say eyebrows? You said yeah. eyebrows. I, did you not say that on purpose? Because I. Yeah, I said that. it on purpose. Very oh, fun. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you? Did you mean eyelashes? Because we thought it was eyebrows, and we thought that was a really great turn of phrase. Yeah, it was meant to be. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, classic I'm, feminine flirting. I'm, I'm the most um, 
innovative comic mind of my generation, of yeah. course. <laughs> I'm fluttering my eyebrows. That's so funny that I Let's said that. Let's all have a go at it. Yeah. I think it was Freudian, though. No, no, I meant it. No, but I mean, if you didn't mean it's Freudian, it's like, it's like your, your brain is so creative, it can't help but invent comedy while you're doing comedy. That's even more of a compliment than if I'd done it on purpose. It's, it was that one. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Um, Chloe, your tour show is called Intransience. No, not in. Not, not in. No, transience. Transience. Sorry, let, let me take that again. You never heard that. <laughs> Don't laugh. Yeah, because they do. If I do a pick-up, they laugh, and they tell, that tells the audience, and I'd be like, why is that funny? She must have made a mistake. Um, do you listen back to the episodes and know that this one I gets used cut to out? listen to every single edit and make my notes, but it got to the point where I couldn't anymore, partly because I think Tom generally knows what I would and wouldn't go for, but I just got exhausted listening to myself, and yeah. I started to hate my voice. No. And No, no, because, no, but if it's yours, you know what it's like. We all... Listen, as feminists, obviously, we love ourselves. However, <laughs> there is a little bit of everyone that finds themselves nauseous making, isn't there? Like, don't you, we all kind of have a bit of... I found myself disgusted until I saw what I looked like. In my reflection, I was fluttering my eyebrow. <laughs> no, you know, that thing of listening to yourself again. If you're a podcaster and you listen to every edit, you're like, oh, fucking hell, this again, you again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if you tell the same story on more than one episode. On my podcast, when I listen, I go... You're telling them about that again, are you? It's yeah, the worst. you can and bore course, yourself. You're 52 episodes a year, of course sometimes you repeat yourself, but people don't... People are too... Fucking polite. long way of saying, no, she doesn't listen back. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't listen back. Fair, fair. This is an example of it, Chloe. Yours. Can you even remember what the pickup was? Yeah. yeah. I'm a pro. It's amazing. Chloe, your tour show is called Transients. <laughs> That's right. Um... Did you say nice rack? No. <laughs> nice rack. I'm a feminist, but nice rack. <laughs> Is that, I mean, I appreciate it. If that's in fact what you said. Uh, my favourite thing that anyone's ever said on the show. I just looked off feminist. into the distance and went, nice rack. <laughs> if I go with the guilty feminist, but I what? can't even remember. I think I just went, that's right. <laughs> Sounded like nice rack. Anyway. Oh, do you have an Listen eye for feminist butt? Do you have an eye for feminist butt? Yeah, I could do one. Great. Feminist butt, nice done it. <laughs> that was that was written in the notes. Uh, no, uh, I'm a feminist, but uh, I don't watch the England women's national football team for their talent. <laughs> oh, very nice. Watch it for the talent, not their talent. They're all so fucking peng, <laughs> right? Every single time a beautiful lady... Every time a lady steps onto a football pitch, she becomes the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my whole entire life. <laughs> do they identify as ladies? I feel like they might not say ladies. Ladies football. They do when I'm talking about it, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really don't like this character that I've come on as. <laughs> <laughs> I do think the problem with... <laughs> We're disappointing we've really, we've really been the... filling out the character for you by hearing things you didn't say, like nice rack. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a great game to play. Um, uh, so, like, everything Chloe says, we just go, did you just ask me out? Um, yeah. Okay, that, that's, 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 a, that's a game called gaslighting. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> really fun game to play, as I said. Yeah, I love that game. Okay. I mean, we'd have to be in a comedy agreement that that's what we were doing, and therefore it wouldn't be gaslighting. I'm yeah. now gaslighting you into thinking I'm not gaslighting you. This is <laughs> so you're a master show. of the genre. Um, Chloe, yeah. your tour show is called Entra... Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> this can be the whole chat. Just how long it takes you to yeah, get honestly, that. Honestly, keep this and all fucking... And the whole in. podcast will end with you going, Chloe, your, your show's called Transients, and Chloe go, yeah, come nice see rack. it. Nice rack. End of oh God. <laughs> end of Chloe, God. your tour show's called Nice Rack. Um, <laughs> that, would, that would be a good name for the next it show. It would be, actually. Especially if you were there, like, with a, with a gun rack or a hat rack or something, like... You know, like I'm a pun, oh, a pun on rack. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, can we... Oh, oh, I've got a good idea. Yeah. Why don't the three of us do a late night improv show called at next fringe called nice rack where we've got a list a sort of props on a rack on a rack right? Love and then 
Iraq, just to be clear, not Iraq. That's going into verging into something else. We probably can't fit Iraq at the, into the end. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. So we have a bunch of like coats and props and things, but the, oh, and each oh, I've got a, each night the audience have to bring things in to put in on the rack. Oh, we don't oh. see what they are. Yeah. So when we come out onto the stage, that's good. You could make it really meta by putting a pair of tits on the rack. <laughs> Someone should do that. Someone should yeah. do that. Would you come to this late night improv show? Yeah. Yeah. You have to bring something. So it could be, you'll get it back at the end. So it could be your coat or it could be a kebab you just got or something. Your like that. tits. You've asked them if they'll come, but you haven't asked me. Chloe, I'm meant to be an in- Chloe, normal would you, member of Nice Rack. Would you, <laughs> with Jess and me, next fringe, do a late night show? It could just be one off, or it could, could be a little season. Would you be part of the improv group Nice Rack? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Hey! Yeah, was, come on! Come <laughs> the right. fuck on! Right. Like, the we, thing is, I know that I like sign up to that now, but you're so like driven as a person that I know that this bit will turn into a reality, I and know, I'll find myself in the next episode. It's my like, problem. I can't doing a show called Nice like, Rack tonight. Then I feel I have to do it now. Yeah, we'll I do really it. Want to do it? But we could just do like a one-off for charity or something like that. Yeah, all right. Oh, that you, we're doing it for the whole month. Are you producing it? What's your name? Lulu. Lulu's in the front row. She's producing Nice Rack now. <laughs> a whole month. That's not a sentence. Okay, is it? Stand alone. <laughs> she's Lulu's pro- producing Nice she's Rack producing now. She's producing a Nice Rack. <laughs> <laughs> Lulu, I mean, Lulu, if you don't mind me saying, you do have a Nice Rack. Whoa! <laughs> Deborah, Deborah's taking on the character it. now. I also fought it, but I also, I'm, I'm a feminist, so I didn't say it. I feel Lulu and I had eye contact that implied you should say that now. I didn't you, have eye contact. You were contact. feeding me, weren't you? you? That was a comedy feed, wasn't it? <laughs> she sort of, she sort of did a little I bit can't of look this. At her anymore. She, she sort of presented. I'm not she, looking at Lulu. She did again. a bit of a carry. She did a I'm, bit of a carry on, like cleavage moment. That's we knew what we were doing. Cle- I Lulu think and I. I'm, what's happened is you had to do a pickup, and Jess and I have just derailed it so completely that the, it has to stay. Everything has to stay. You can't cut Everything has that. to stay. Lu- well, be Lulu no has to be an inaugural, inaugural member of Nice, nice Rack. <laughs> Despite the fact I can never look at her again, now we've done that to her, I'm more likely to look at my new passport picture again than I am <laughs> to look at Lulu. And we'll all eyes. stand in, with, in the picture, I think for the poster, we should all have the hold the rack in front of us breast height yeah. mm. with little props on it'll be yeah. great really Chloe nice. your tour show <laughs> is called Transient that's right you nailed that what <laughs> they called me one take Francis White <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> why did you call it Transient um, well Initially, when I was trying to name the show, I named the show at the beginning of the lockdown, actually. Yeah. And I just thought, transience, that sounds so smart. It's going to be about the mutability of time. It's going to be about all of this stuff. And that was basically, uh, yes. What does mutability mean? Integrally, I don't know. So this is the problem, is yeah. that I thought I would get so much reading done during that first lockdown that I didn't get done. Yeah. So then it just um, became a show about toilet humour, really. But I think toilet humour in, in a clever way yeah. because it's about my experiences of entering women's spaces mm-hmm. as a sort of masculine person who's very tall, who I also wear a binder and stuff like that. So it's, it's sort of about, yeah, my, it's a pun on trans science, I guess, and it's yeah. like my experiences as a sort of... You know, I, I, I largely identify as a woman, but I have had some gender dysphoria and stuff like that. But it kind of doesn't matter because it's more, it doesn't matter what I feel and how I feel about myself. It's more about how when I enter those women's only spaces, I'm doing in, inverted commas quotations for the listen, listeners at home. It's more about how other people perceive me and decide that they're allowed to act because of you know, cultural conversations that are going on at the moment and, and how that f- empowered they feel to sort of make comments. And shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's nice a- rack was funnier. That's what I will say. <laughs> <laughs> but it sort of is about, it's about the um, uh, confines of gender. And the g- gender presentation, gender identity, gender uh, implications and projections. And in a, in, a, in a world which is 
increasingly putting up barriers to trans people and, and creating suspicions around trans people. Mm. If you are not trans, but you are also not gender conforming, what does that mean for you? Mm. Is that is that what the show's about? Yeah, I suppose so. But I think it's more just like a... It, it was. I wanted to basically like use my experience to basically like I, I guess befriend an audience that might will often contain a lot of allies, but might contain people that are confused about that kind of thing, or or have some questions, or a bit sort of have a knee jerk reaction against trans people, and basically try and like befriend them and say, look, look just trust me like these are the experiences that I have like if you don't think they're nice happening to me then maybe they shouldn't happen to everyone you know and, and sort of using that as a, as a means of like going into battle on this this kind of thing but 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 going into battle feels like a bit of a weird phrase to say because it feels more like the thing that I want everyone to do is just chill out everyone that doesn't have like a sort of hand in the trans issues it's nothing to do with them it's just like why are you making it your problem it just it's none of your business just piss off like <laughs> yeah no one's there's a, there's like a big panic around it right no one's trying to turn your kids trans no one's trying to do anything yeah. shitty they're just trying to go around and live their life but yeah it's turned into this big culture war that it doesn't need to be i guess because it's just like a bunch of bored people that are i don't know it's it feel bizarre. like it is they want to be oppressed the number of people who have decided to make it their their reason for their existence their main thing Purpose, yeah and it, i that think is th who, for whom it's utterly fucking irrelevant yeah. it's so bizarre so sometimes i think that. and tell me if this is problematic and if it is please can we edit it out but <laughs> sometimes i think that like there's a certain like class of woman that has become so near like unoppressed in society that they still wish to participate like they want to identify as oppressed so they've chosen like trans people as the people that are like is that unfair i mean i would certainly say there are individuals within classes that have that that feeling of or the that i think there's definitely people who've got a hard on for feeling oppressed and victimy, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, like, that becomes their, like, a massive part of their identity. Yeah, or it's a way of saying... It's quite an I... addictive thing, because you get a lot of compassion. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also um, wanting to... I feel stronger with a team, and um, mm -hmm. I tend not to word, use the word tribe anymore because I know it's problematic for people, but it's... Um, I didn't. Heads it's up. That, it's... <laughs> It's, Noted. it's that, uh, I think it was so imposed on... Too late, as per. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think... It, Stop <laughs> saying try. <laughs> I think it's been so imposed by Western anthropologists on to Indigenous people that we tend to not say that anymore. But I, it's, it's this sort of like, oh, safety in numbers. If I, if I create a team around me, then, and to, in order to have a team, I need to be saying who are we against and who do yeah. we exclude. But I think it is strange, the fear of trans people, given how few trans people there are yeah. and how already obviously marginalised trans people's lives are. Um, and so I'm very interested in this show. And actually, we've got another guest tonight who's singing who did a brilliant Edinburgh show that's in line with this show that I think might make a great co-discussion for the rest of this discussion. Are we down for that? Yeah. Then so please I'm get a chair. Welcome to the stage and to the conversation, the incredible Grace Petrie. Woo! Yeah, she's brought her own chair. She's brought her own chair. Well, good evening, everybody. Hello. And uh, listen, nice rack. Uh, <laughs> We That's now, what I gleaned we now from backstage. Lineup. Seems to be the theme of would tonight, like unintentionally. To, would you like to be in our improv group, Nice Rack? Yes, and... <laughs> hey! Oh. She got the job. She's ready. She's ready. Yes, would you and. do improvised songs? Can we give songs, it a different Deborah? name? Do you reckon you do improvised songs? Well, Deborah, you've obviously forgotten the one time I tried on the podcast, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> it um, went very badly. Um, well, I reckon we could practice it. The reason I wanted to bring you in, Grace, is I saw your show, Butch Do About Nothing, in Edinburgh, and I Didn't thought... fuck that one up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 
Amazing. <laughs> um, and I thought it would have been better if it was called Nice Rack, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, Many have said it. Yeah. Or great arse. I don't know. These are just suggestions. Great arse? What's uh, happening to the guilty feminists tonight? Exactly. It, Fuck yeah. Uh, hell, the uh, wheels uh, have uh, come I've off. been on it for months. Okay. First one back. A lot more guilty than feminists. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it, it is the influence of Jess Bosnick, yeah. let's be honest. Um, what about I would, but would is spelled W-O-D. Um, Move it on. Move okay, it on. Okay, okay. I wanted to hear you and Chloe talk about this because your show was a real game changer for me. It was a real... I first saw your show uh, in the airport at, in... Uh, this, I think it was like the Canberra airport or something like that. We were at the gate. It was just Grace and me. And Grace... I assisted Grace to do the whole show. She needed more previews. And so I said, well, I'll be the audience. And we nearly missed the plane. We're, we did the whole... Ga- but I was crying at the, in, at the gate. People thought we were breaking up, I think. <laughs> But also laughing a lot. It was lovely. Deborah, and you are like the taxi driver that's like, <coughs> right, you're a comedian, do us a joke then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made you're, her do her whole... You do a comedy show, do the whole show then. <laughs> I'm exactly like that. Uh, I'm exactly like but that. But unlike most comedians in a taxi, I was like, oh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind if I do. <laughs> and so I saw it there, then I saw it twice in Edinburgh, and it was absolutely brilliant. And I really wanted Grace to tour it so everyone could see it. And she was like, well, it's not really what I do. I'm, you know, I'm a singer and uh, I'm going to go back to, to, you know, doing my singer-songwriter stuff. But I really would love you to record it as a special because I think everyone should see it. But I wanted you and Chloe maybe to talk about some of the themes in it because I just loved your piece, especially around your feelings as a butch lesbian mm. and this sort of new wave coming up. And I wondered if, you know, if I stopped talking, would you and Chloe talk to each other about it? Oh, it's like we're on a play date. Um, uh, so nice. Bit of rough and tumble with the boy. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's nice to see um, you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I was desperate to see your show, but we clashed, I think, um, in Edinburgh. So I'm still desperate. And I think I am. My girlfriend today informed me that we have a guest list to see your show in Norwich. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so I was gutted not to see it, but I do. Uh, when you were talking about it backstage, I was like, yeah, I feel like. There's a lot of crossover between what we were talking about and stuff. Um, and then, um, massively on point, I went to get a beer in preparation for coming on stage and I got called Sir at the Bar. <laughs> so it was really just like... Uh, How does it make you feel when you get called Sir? Well, it's interesting, man. Like, I, uh, yeah, there's a lot of my show is about this, actually, and about the sort of... Um, I get misgendered as well, like, a, a lot of my life. And... Uh, I've really sort of been on a real journey with it, I suppose, and like, and I have a bit in my show. I mean, I'm going to sort of try and be brief, but in the show, it sort of has a context that makes it again seem less problematic. It might seem a bit problematic here, but I sort of have a bit about how there's a modern trend of sort of assuming that people go by they, mm. and how I find that as uh, someone who's kind of fought quite hard to stand comfortably in she, her, which I didn't for a long time. It took me years and years and years to stand comfortably there. Now I kind of feel quite defensive of, like, being a she, her. But then I sort of went from that into talking about transphobes and how, you know, teams and how easily we can all kind of feel defensive of our own little patch in the world, you know, and actually how the wisdom of that, I suppose, you know. I love the bit where you said, I kind of get get it the fear of is this being taken away in some way Mm. but then you talked about that your desire to sort of hold on to your patch came out of the deep loneliness that you felt when you were younger and how you felt about the younger generation really redefining the space Mm. um do you know what i'm yeah and i suppose i mean like ultimately like we have so much we have such a massive more massively more fluid understanding of gender and language around gender now than when I was a kid we definitely just didn't you know when I was a kid there just was no non-binary you know what I mean like I mean I know that there definitely were trans people that were obviously living significantly sort of harder lives hopefully than they are today but the idea of like any kind of ambiguity around gender Mm. 
was not really a he thing. He you certainly know what didn't I mean? have the language. The language. Didn't have, didn't have the language, yeah. yeah and certainly I th- and people I th- were non-binary, but they didn't, we didn't have that language. Sure, yeah, I suppose that's what I mean, is there wasn't a lot of kind of, yeah, we didn't have the sort of terms to put it into, but, um, you know, so for me, kind of, you know, being born in the late 80s and growing up in the 90s and the early noughties, I just was kind of receiving a message that I was an inadequate kind of girl. You know, and that Mm. was something that really took root in me for a really long time. And I talked about that in my songs and stuff. Um, And, um, and, you know, now we do have so much more representation and nuance. And there's this massive fluidity around it. And that is wonderful. It really is wonderful. Mm. And then I suppose for people like me, you know, I'm in my mid-30s now. And I'm kind of looking around and going... I used to be the radical one, man. Like, I used to be on the cutting edge. And, like, now there's all these younger people coming up, you know, 15, 20 years after me. And they're kind of making me feel like this space that I fought for doesn't really need to be here. And my initial reaction to that was, like, that does make me feel quite threatened. But obviously the conclusion of it is, like, it's better. Like, that's, this is what we fought for, right? We fought for a world in which mm. everybody could be free and be who they are. And it's good that we're there, you know? Yeah. And, like... Maybe it does make yeah. people like me feel a bit sad, but that doesn't make it bad. I think I remember in your show you saying that 50% of young people... Millennials, yeah. Millennials and Gen Zs, oh, 50 or over 50% would not identify fully as straight. In some way, they'd say they were queer. And uh, somebody... One just, of them's in. Yeah. <laughs> and that you said that and you said so you know uh, there's not there's so much uh, a, I guess a need for this is a butch lesbian space mm. and you, I remember I was being very I was very moved by you saying um, it feels like uh, the, they're packing the party away and I've just got here but if it means that young people don't have to be lonely the way that I felt when I was young because it's a, they're making the whole world a queer space. That's a wonderful thing. I don't need them to be lonely yeah. so that I can feel that the language I carved out or the club I carved out or whatever is still relevant. I want to know how you feel when you're misgendered. I think it's an absolute minefield. You uh, asked it as a question, but you uh, didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. It. Well, I think also, that, that just bouncing off from what you said, Grace, like, I think... I'm also just really grateful to the generation above me because you, like every generation probably looks at the generation lower than them and feels a bit resentful or a bit sad that they don't get that party. But the only reason we get the party is because of what you guys did before. And I think, you know, if you can see that as your legacy rather than the other side of it, which is where, you know, people get bitter and then that's where they might... Mm get transphobic or turfy, I don't know, then, then, then I think that's a great thing. In terms of when I get misgendered, I think <clears throat> I have very little control over how people perceive me, and I find it very interesting. I don't know how people perceive me. It, it just confuses me. But I'm going to get called whatever gender that person wants to call me. So I'd rather they just, like, fall in the middle and sit in their own... Because it's not about me, it's about them. I'd rather they fall in the middle, sit in their own confusion and just call me they, rather than needing to categorise me. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I feel like sometimes when I'm called she or I'm called he and then someone corrects themselves and calls me she, I'm kind of like, why does it matter? Mm-hmm. Why does it matter? Because I know who I am and I feel very safe and comfortable in that and I'm never going to be able to control the perceptions of all of you. So just why don't you just embrace some more inclusive language right yeah of course of course and yeah. and you know it just makes me think again i mean like you know i was i um went to a and e for something a couple of months ago nothing bad i just got something in my eye and i was like waiting there for hours and hours and i was the only person in there and i was increasingly worried that they had sort of that i because when i arrived at the hospital um the first member of staff that greeted me said you know, good evening, sir. Yeah. And I just didn't... Most of the time when I'm alone, I just don't correct people. Because, again, I agree with you. It's sort of... It's not really about me. And then and then I kind of well, sat there... It's an extraordinary effort time after time. Yeah, it really you're is. you're not and feeling I, one, if yeah. you've got something in your eye... Well, that's like, it. Well, actually... I know. It was, I had a lot of eye stuff going on. It was really fit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was, like, sitting there waiting, waiting. And then I started to think, fuck, like, I wonder if, you know... Someone's come out looking for a man yeah, in the yeah, waiting yeah. room and, 
You know what I mean? I started to think, oh, I wonder if this is logistically, if I've been miscategorized somewhere. And then I just, obviously, that just led on to, why the fuck do we do this? Mm. What is with sir? What is with madam? Why do, like, what, what, what need is there in the world to basically say to people, the moment you see them, I have categorized you. We just don't need to do it. And we're so, and that's kind of, you know, like the thing, what you said in the um, dressing room is like, um, I'm going to bastardize what you said, but it was about, legitimizing the conversation right we don't even need to be having the conversation about a lot of these things and oh, brain yeah. is one of these things it's like how how is it the case that the planet is like on fire <laughs> And we are spending so much time talking about pronouns. Like, guys, this fucking biggest fish to fry. Literally, we're the fish, we're frying. Yeah. You know? I, I agree. I feel like if people are just allowed to say, I, this suits me the best. Yeah. It, it, this, this, is, this is what feels good for me. This is the name. Like, we don't mind when people change their names. You know, if I've got plenty of friends who was raised as one name, but as they got to a certain point, it didn't really suit them and they started, took on their middle name or an abbreviation or, or a whole new name they just made up for themselves or the name that, that someone called them at uni or something like that. And that's their name. And nobody goes, but that's not really who you are. Like, because they get, if you've changed your name the one, from the one of your birth certificate, it's because it didn't fit you in some way or you changed out of your name. But we are much less suspicious of someone's changed name. We change our name when we get married and no one's weird about that. Like, we take on a man's name from usually the man's name who gave it to us. As women, we're always walking around with kind of male appendages like you know nomenclature um, appendages yeah. no okay all right you know what I mean. n- n- wordy wordy ones <laughs> sorry i'm laughing at appendages <laughs> <laughs> nice rack um <laughs> hi grace are you going to sing us a song song about politics okay. um, because we are on the eve of um, a nurses strike tomorrow um, there's obviously lots and lots of strikes happening in Britain at the moment um, because uh, we have a dreadfully corrupt government and, uh, and we need to show solidarity with the strikers don't we do we not <laughs> So I thought I'd sing you a fairly old song um, that I wrote quite a few years ago. Now, it's the first song that I ever wrote about politics in the, back in the days of austerity. Yeah, so obviously it's not relevant at all anymore. Yeah. Now, I wrote this song way back in 2010. I was trying to get rid of David Cameron. And, uh, and it worked. Um, but uh, but uh, he was replaced by Theresa May. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> what have I fucking done? Right? Um, so, you know, I thought I better, I better write some more songs and, and, and get rid of her, you know, um, which, and, and, you know, it worked again. Um, I mean, I think there were some other factors, but it was mostly my songs, I think. Um, uh, and then, uh, so, you know, I got rid of her. <laughs> she was replaced by Boris Johnson. And I thought, well, it can't get any worse than that. Right? <laughs> So I wrote some more songs, got rid of Boris Johnson, and then, you know, I did not get a chance to write any songs about Liz Truss. Um, <laughs> London, I was not quick enough. Um, anyway, listen, up the workers, up the nurses, up the strikers, this is called Farewell to Well. <laughs> To recapture the benefits of Section 28 And it's never too wild To slash benefits for single mums The only victim is the child And oh, who's gonna be my Billy Jean King? And I'll say, who's gonna be my Harvey Milk? And on the steps of Parliament Well, they're demonstrating that what's the use When they're all cut from the same eaten silk I'll say farewell, farewell to welfare And we've got a recession to be 
Let's put more money into the monarchy And a millionaire in Downing Street And someone's got to foot the bill Let's start with the disabled and the mentally ill And if I keep my receipts Can I claim back the mistakes And the lives ruined by this government? Or in another 18 years of budget cuts and tears Will the people pay for those just like we pay your rent And say farewell, farewell to welfare So give me change, give me equality Give me a minister for women that don't fucking represent me Give me a decent, honest Nick who's on the level Until the first glimpse of pie he'll make a deal with the devil And you tell me that this is democracy And you tell me that it ain't no old boys club And as the thousands march on Westminster And look how quickly their demands are snug In. So you'll find me in the pub Raising a toast To the ghost Of welfare And I used to dream Of a Britain Where I'd be Proud to bring up kids These days I'd settle for a Britain Where I'd be allowed to bring up kids And Mrs May, if I may be so bold as to say That your archaic view of family holds no relevance today And if you think that honest people really should be turned away From IVF and B&Bs just because they're gay I suggest you stop requesting that we continue to pay our taxes to a party that's held us back all the way. So I'll take my business and my produce and my income tax elsewhere and say farewell, farewell to welfare. I'll say farewell, farewell to welfare. one that was uh, is closest to community, closest to college age. Do you know her? Annie. Anna. Annie. 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 Yeah, I'll do it again so that the audience at home know, don't think I don't know her name. <laughs> um, it's all a con. Okay. Um, so, do you guys know community? Yeah. yeah. So, do you know the character of Annie? Yeah. <laughs> don't laugh or they'll know. <laughs> Tom we'll leaves Do that all again. Is. We'll do a pick up, but this time, do your job better. <laughs> Pretend you don't know. Okay. So, do you know Community? Yeah. yeah. Do you know Annie? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great character. Um, she, there's one, it's a very parodic show. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.